بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We are learning about the uh, lives of the prophets and the messengers of Allah عليهم أفضل الصلاة والتسليم And today inshallah we're going to continue on part two on the life of Nuh, the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. <clears throat> Taking off from where we left off last week, I'll recap just a few seconds. He is Nuh alayhi salam. He is about the 10th generation after Adam alayhi salam. Abdullah ibn Abbas, the great companion of the Prophet sallallahu said, there was between Adam and Nuh, Ten generations, Ashratul Qurun, and ten generations here is understood to be uh, 100 years each. So we don't know if it's 100 years of our time that we count today, or was it ten generations from the generations that they used to count in those days. If we were to take it in our time, then from the death of Adam salam to the time Nuh salam came around, it would have been a thousand years. If we were to take it according to generations that they used to count, because they lived very long, generation would be a whole generation that lived approximately a thousand years each generation. So there would have been thousands of years between Adam and Nuh. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. My brothers and sisters in Islam, he was the fourth or fifth great grandson of Adam alayhi salam. And there came these uh, righteous men after the Prophets, their names were Wad, Suwa, Yaghuth, Ya'uq, and Nasra. The five main names, and from them originated all of idolatry. Right up to the time of Quraysh and even till today. The Hindus, the Buddhists, the uh, uh, all sorts of uh, religions out there which uh, are idolatry religions who worship uh, other gods. These came from these five. And these five were righteous men, and uh, the people started to wanting to uh, follow the shaitan's uh, advice and he made them slowly, we discussed this last week, but he made them slowly go from mem uh, remembering these righteous men to building statues and images of them near their graves and from that memorial there came the worship of these idols in the later generations to come. They used to give them offerings like food, they used to slaughter their animals in their names they used to swear oath by their names. And they basically governed the people. People made money out of them. People used to slaughter and give offerings to these statues. And the elites, the people who ran the whole thing, you can say like the government, but they weren't really government. They just used to be more like a jungle that time. The strongest sort of uh, whoever's in power, whoever's more wealth, whoever just makes it up there, they're, they're in power. So these people in power started making money out of people who were sacrificing, giving wealth to these statues. So it's a, it was a commodity that they used to make profit and to oppress people. Brothers and sisters, this is why graves in Islam are not meant to be built up. It's actually against the Sunnah to, it's forbidden. If somebody dies, that we build their graves, tombstones, you know, whether it's out of marble or anything like that. You go to the Muslim graveyards these days, in the West especially, and uh, you see that we are trying to imitate and copy the Christians by building really high tombstones. And some graves, alhamdulillah, are still in accordance with the Sunnah. Anybody who says otherwise, well then, Muhammad sallam, the best of creation, Abu Bakr and Umar, Man and the rest of the Sahabas, all their graves are flat with the ground. They're flat. The grave of the Prophet at the moment has got a wall around it since the time of the Khalifa Amr ibn Abdul Aziz, but that's to prevent people from turning it into a, a place of worship or people starting to worship the Prophet. So he, uh, he, he separated it from the main masjid when the masjid expanded. It's the only reason why you have a wall around the Prophet's grave. Otherwise, there's nothing extraordinary about it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, May Allah curse those Jews and Christians who made the graves of their prophets into places of worship. Prophets were not, not their graves were not meant to be places of worship. And certainly the graves of our families that we bury them in should not be built up high. For the same reason that nobody is superior to another. 
And when people start building tombstones, they turn them into a special thing for that person. If not our generation, the generation that comes, the generation after it, third, fourth, people start questioning. If you see a grave today that's built up really high, automatically you're going to think that this must have been a very superior person, like the pharaohs, for example. So the Prophet ﷺ, he ordered Ali radiallahu anhu before his death, he said, do not leave a grave that is higher than the ground, except that you have made it flat with the ground. Do not make a grave high. And you're not even meant to write the names, but only for policy government purposes, you write the names. You can have a, a rock or some kind of special uh, item that you want to put there, just to identify the grave, to know whose it is, like some of the Sahabas did that. Otherwise, building the grave is actually haram in Islam. Nobody is superior to another, and that money is better spent to donate that, or charity, or make an ongoing piece of knowledge on behalf of the person who has died, and they will benefit more from that. My brothers and sisters, I just wanted to make that point. It actually originated from the time of Nuh alayhi salam. So Nuh alayhi salam gave da'wah, he invited his people for such a long time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to his people when he, they did shirk, and shirk is polytheism. When you worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the modern day, a lot of, the, especially in the West, people worship themselves. They worship materialism. They worship the money. They worship themselves. As Allah says in the Quran, Have you heard of the one who makes himself as their own God? And we live in a modern world where people have made themselves their own gods. And materialism their own gods. And desires their own gods. This idea of product obsolescence, if you ever heard of it where you buy a product and you just keep it for a number of days and nothing's wrong with it, then you buy another product. Or products are made to become obsolete. They actually go out of order within a certain time frame. And then they throw these machines in third world countries to pollute their countries and then they try to recycle them and salvage them in some way. And this is the way that people are bound now. We worship, a lot of people worship the money and the, the materialism. And really, everybody in the world has got a God of some sort. Everybody worships something. Because whatever you worship governs your entire life. Whatever takes over your salah, whatever takes over your, your worship, you know, inside of you, you prioritize it. Inside of you, you feel it. That's more important to you. Then that becomes your God. Right? Whatever it, it may be. So deities come in all forms and sizes, all shapes, not just, not just stones. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, how long did Dawood, uh, Nuh salam, give da'wah to his people? 950 years. How do I know this? From the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Ankabut, chapter 29, verse 14, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَلَبِثَ فِيهِمْ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ إِلَّا خَمْسِينَ عَامًا فَأَخَذَهُمُ الطُّوفَانُ وَهُمْ ظَالِمُونَ Allah said, We did indeed send Nuh to his people. And he lived among them a thousand years, sana, except for fifty عام, which also means years, Eventually the flood overtook them while they were engaged in wrongdoing. In this particular verse, I just want to highlight something interesting for you if you recite it. When you read the verse, it says, فَلَبِثَ فِيهِمْ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ Nuh salam, stayed among his people 1,000 sana. Sana means years in English. And then Allah says, except for 50, and this time he didn't use sana, years, he used aman. And in Arabic, sana and am both mean years in English. But the difference in Arabic is, as I told you, the Arabic language is extremely rich. And there isn't a word that's placed in the Qur'an that Allah spoke except that it has a reason. The reason for sana is because when the Arabs used the word sana for years, it meant it was a tough, hard and harsh year full of agony and pain and hardship. We use sana. As for am, it means it was a year of ease and relief. Okay? As in Surah Yusuf, when he saw the dream, he said, تَزْرَعُونَ سَبْعَ سِنِينَ دَأَبًا you will, you, will, you will plant and plow and go through hardship of plowing for seven years. And then another seven years. And then he, he said seven without saying sana. So the word sana is hardship. Am is time of ease. So, when Nuh called them for 950 sana, it was hard. And then after the flood, 50 years, yani if you're going to say a thousand, except for 50 years, 
of A's because Nuh lived in A's after that. Now Nuh lived more than a thousand years. But in this verse, it's saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just used the word 1,000 except 50. 950 years da'wah except for 50. And then he lived on another 250 years or so. Some ulama say he lived up to 1,750 years. Others they say 1,150, 1,300 years. So my brothers and sisters, long time. And we mentioned last week that Nuh alayhi salam gave his da'wah in every way, shape and form to his people. He did it in public and in secret. In, and, and in every communication style that you can imagine. Allah mentions the entire story or a lot of the, a lot of the way that he preached to them. His communication in Surah Nuh. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala focuses a lot about Nuh alayhi salam telling his Lord how he preached to them and how he reminded them and how he went to them in public and in private and how he told them why they should worship and who is Allah. He exhausted himself and did not give up a single day, Nuh alayhi salam. 950 years, 365 days a year, including the lunar, the lunar years and 366 days without the rest of a single day or night, my brothers and sisters, except for his own, uh, for his food or his sleep. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it in Surah Nuh for those who want to read the amazing way that the Prophets called their people. But I can tell you something very common between the way all the Prophets called their people. They all, the, all the Prophets called their people in the most compassionate and merciful manner. Whenever they called their people, they invited them, wishing and willing and um, hoping and really wanting the best for their people. They feared upon them. See, in the Quran, Allah says, Inni akhafu alaykum. Nuh alayhi salam to say to his people, I'm afraid for you. I'm afraid for you, a terrible punishment, chastisement as a result of your actions. Now, he is the messenger of Allah, the merciful Allah only sends merciful prophets. And you will see as you come here, inshallah, throughout all the prophet series, every single one of them called in the same manner, with the same intention, in the same way. Except that some of them a little bit longer than others, some of them went through more hardship than others. My brothers and sisters in Islam, after 950 years, close to 950 years, only about 80 people believed and followed Nuh alayhi salam. Included in these 80 people are some members of his family, but not all members of Nuh alayhi salam's family even followed him and believed. And this tells us that you try with your family as well. And sometimes members of your family will not follow you. What do you do in that state? You do the right thing. And you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make dua for them, for Allah to guide them. But never judge them, you will, as you will see inshallah coming up. Instead of these people following Nuh alayhi salam, he received the worst of mockery, the worst of swear words, the worst of denigrations. And this is the difference, brothers and sisters, between somebody when they speak the truth and somebody when they speak hypocrisy or falsehood. What is it? Muhammad sallallahu describes it. He says, as for the hypocrite, when he or she speaks, you can tell. How can you tell? Either khasama fajr. When you disagree with them, they explode. How do they explode? They start to attack. They start to swear. They start to yell. They start to use denigrating words. They start to accuse you. They start to remind you of your bad things. They start to character assassinate the person so that they can move away from the truth. But when a person speaking the truth, they stay calm. They repeat the same words. Right? They, you can see it on their faces and in their hearts that they are sincere. You can tell. And that's how all the prophets did so. So whenever they mocked him, he did not mock them back. Whenever they denigrated him, he did not denigrate them back. All he used to say to them is, I fear upon you. I fear upon you. You do this to their messenger. Even Muhammad وسلم, when the people used to try to harm the Prophet وسلم, such as in the battle of, uh, of Uhud, he said, how can a people prosper when they harm and hurt their own messenger of God? I fear upon them. Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. The Rasul sallallahu Allahumma ahdi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. He used to say, oh Allah, guide my people for they just do not know. And such was Nuh alayhi salam. Brothers and sisters, you will find that the people of Nuh, after all these years, what did they do? They challenged him. They said, Ya Nuh, fa'tina bima ta'iduna in kunta min as-sadiqeen. 
Why don't you bring upon us this punishment that you are talking about if you are truthful? So they started to challenge him and they want the punishment of Allah to come down upon them. This is in Surah Hud if you want to read it, inshaAllah ta'ala. And Nuh alayhi salam, he tells them, Oh my people, if I wanted bad for you and you don't want my advice from you, can't you see that I do not ask you for any money? I don't ask you for any reward. Why would I call you when I don't really mean it well towards you? And if I am lying to you, then my lie is against me. I take it on my shoulders. And he tried to tell them all sorts of things. And in the end he said, In the end, Nuh said, I'm not going to force it upon you when you don't want it. So Nuh did this for 950 years until suddenly an amazing news came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was this news? It was the most unfortunate and bad news upon Nuh alayhi salam for the past 950 years. What was it? Allah said to him, It was revealed to Nuh that no more of your people other than those who already believed will ever come to believe. So do not grieve over their deeds. Allah had told him that no one will ever believe in you anymore. That's it. Whoever you see, those 80 people with you or so, that's it. So these people are going to keep living and give birth to people who are also disbelievers and corrupted, who will give more birth to other people who are corrupted and the righteous will run out and so the earth will be inherited by corrupted people. Allah will never accept that. Brothers and sisters in Islam, listen very carefully to the way Allah made this world. Allah will never destroy a people. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. Allah will never destroy a people until the corruption and disbelief has exceeded beyond measure. And there isn't anyone left who can still put the people on the right track. Unrighteousness. If no one can affect these people anymore in goodness, in righteousness, and there is so much corruption that exceeds beyond bound that the next generation or the third is going to all be corrupt, and the news and the message has come to them and the warnings clear as the sun, Allah destroys those people and replaces them with those who live out righteousness as He initially created this world to be. Once the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, woke up and he was angry and his face was red and he said in front of his wife Umm Salama Woe to the Arabs from a bad thing that has come close. Today I saw in my dream that this much, he did this with his finger like a ring, this much has been opened from the door of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Allahu Alam, the meaning of that. But he said, the last hour is coming near. And for some reason, the Arabs themselves are going to suffer the most in the Middle East, for some reason. And then, his wife, Umm Salama said, or is it Zainab, Zainab, the wife of Prophet Salam, Zainab, she said, Ya Rasulullah, anahliku wa fina salihun. Will we be destroyed, even if among us there are the righteous ones? He said, yes. Ida kathura. إِذَا كَثُرَ الْخَبَثِ He said, yes, you can be destroyed if corruption exceeds beyond measure. Only Allah knows who deserves to be destroyed and who doesn't. This is not up to us. It's not in our hands. And we cannot judge who is corrupt and who is not. Only Allah can. But Allah destroys the people when there is no more good in them. Why? Because Allah did not create this world to be inherited by people who corrupted. But by people who are righteous to guide the, right, the, the non-righteous. And he will always give them respite and time for them to return, always. And he will give them the messages Allah said in the Quran, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولَ We will never punish a people or torture them until we have sent them a messenger. But for Nuh alayhi salam, Allah told him, no more will believe. Like, forget about it. No more hope. Whether you call them or don't, that's it. 
And that is when Nuh alayhi salam gave up. Now you might say that you don't think that Nuh, the prophets, would never give up. Ever. Even if it was another thousand, another 950 years, Nuh alayhi salam would have kept on calling them to the deen. A mu'min never gives up to the last breath. But when Allah told him there will be no more believers, nothing can change this anymore. Because otherwise you're saying Allah doesn't know anything. He doesn't know everything. The fact that Allah said it, it means it was sealed. At this point, Nuh stepped back and he started to complain to Allah about his people. He said, oh Allah, I've called them and I've done this and I have done that and I said this and I said that. And finally, all they did was bad and all they did was refuse and all they did was challenge and all they did was mock and all they did was... Oh my Lord, if you leave them alive, then they will only give birth to generations who will only corrupt and disbelieve in you and turn the world into corruption. And finally, Nuh made his famous dua, which is not only known in the Quran, but is also shared by almost every, by every major actually, by every major religion that exists today, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism. Those religions all know about Nuh They all know about the flood. They all know about um, this same thing. And subhanAllah, the Qur'an also asserts it. He said in Surah Nuh, and also a little bit in Surah Hud, Nuh said, My Lord, do not leave out of these unbelievers even a single dweller on earth. For certainly if you should leave them alive, they will mislead your servants and will beget none but sinners and utter unbelievers. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to his dua. And he said, Okay, now move away from the people, Ya Nuh, and go up into the mountain. The angels will be waiting for you, and there will be trees that you're going to cut and plant, and they're going to teach you how to build an ark, a massive ship. I am going to flood them. So do not worry about their misdeeds. وَلَا تَأْسَ Meaning, don't feel sorry for them anymore. You've done what you can. إِنَّهُمْ <laughs> Allah put them on earth. Allah is the only one who has the right to take them back. إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ To Allah we belong and to Him we shall return. Only Allah has a right to give the life. And only Allah has the right to take the life. So he said to him, go into the mountain and build your ark. Now there is a wisdom behind why he told him to go into the mountain. Why not build the ark near the, on the sand, near the beach, near the, near the shore, near the sea? No, he told him, build it in the mountain. And that is in order to teach us a lesson. Wisdom and knowledge, this is where the difference between the ignorant person and the person endued with knowledge and wisdom they are separated. An ignorant person looks at things on a surface level, just what they see. And then they start judging based on what they see on the outside. A person with knowledge thinks below the surface. They think deeper. What is it? Let me explain. When he went up into the mountains and started to build the ark, the angels used to come to him and teach him because he didn't know. He used to cut the trees make planks of wood out of them. This is in the Qur'an. Allah says, وَحَمَلْنَاهُ عَلَىٰ ذَاتِ أَلْوَاحٍ وَدُسُرٍ In Surah Al-Qamar, Allah says, we held him and we made him, we made him sail on planks of wood and dusur means tiny nails, iron nails. وَحَمَلْنَاهُ عَلَىٰ ذَاتِ أَلْوَاحٍ وَدُسُرٍ He used to cut the trees, make planks, Make the nails by the guidance of the angels and build the ark. Allah says, وَاصْنَعِ الْفُلْكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا وَوَحْيِنَا Allah said, so now build the ark with our command or with our guidance and with our wahi, with our angels sent to you to teach you. فَإِذَا فَارَتَّ النُّورِ There is a particular oven. In the olden days they used to build the bricks like a circular motion and shape and inside they used to light up fire and make bread they used to stick it on the walls of the inside of that oven not like the ovens we have today in electricity and gas so they used to do that and he said there's this particular oven that you will see up in the mountain when the tanur this oven 
floods with water, and you see the water coming out of it. فَحْمِلْ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ زَوْجَيْنِ Go and get a male and a female pair of every creature and put them onto the ark. وَأَهْلَكَ And members of your family. إِلَّا مَنْ سَبَقَ عَلَيْهِ الْقَوْلِ Except the members of your family who did not believe. Who chose not to believe. Now the Qur'an doesn't say who they were. We don't know how many. But the Qur'an does mention two at least. It mentions his wife. She rejected and disbelieved in Nuh. And she did something even worse. She started teaching the people that he is crazy. She used to say to them, إِنَّهُ مَجْنُونَ Abdullah bin Abbas talks about this. A righteous prophet is character assassinated by his own wife. And who is there to believe more than the wife? You see, they say, the ulama say that the wife is the best witness about her husband. But sometimes the wife can conspire and be the worst in character assassinating her husband. If she wants to. Or if he wants to as well, the, husband, the other way around. What she did was, she said, Inna majnun. And this is similar to Abu Lahab, the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad is to go around and says, Here's my nephew, I know him, he's crazy. And people start to believe when it's a family member. So Allah mentions her in Surah Al-Tahreem. He says, uh, Allah has given an example of those who believe. Imra'ata Lut, the wife of Lut, السلام, she disbelieved. Wamra'ata Nuh and the wife of Nuh, khanat fakhanata huma. These two wives, they betrayed their husbands. How did they betray him? Not by cheating in the bed. Billah. There are some sayings, and these are incorrect, have no authenticity, no source. They say that the wife of Nuh and the wife of Lut, they actually cheated on them sexually. Astaghfirullah And some even go to the lengths of saying that his son was illegitimate. He was a child of zina. A'udhu Billah. The, the scholars do not agree on this unanimously, and in fact, the verses of the Quran all go against it. In fact, Allah ibn Abbas used to say, as the Prophet said, No wife of any Prophet ever cheated on him sexually. Allah does not accept that for any Prophet. But what it means is that she, they betrayed him. Nuh's wife used to go around and call him a crazy man behind his back, and he didn't know it. And the second one was his son. Nuh had a son, he had several sons. And one of them was by the name of... Now this is an Israelite tradition. It doesn't come in the Hadith or in the Quran. They say in Israelite tradition, traditions that his name was Kenan. Kan'an. Kan'an. He was a rebellious son. And he chose not to believe in his father, but he kept it a secret. He didn't tell his father, but he used to go around and conspire against him. He actually despised his father. He hated his father. He didn't want to be around his father. He started disobeying his father. He started tricking his father. And he disbelieved. All the upbringing and all the raising that Nuh exerted towards his son, subhanAllah, after all that time, he grew up to what? To become an entirely corrupt work. His whole entirety, his mind, his emotions, his body, his belief, everything about this son was completely corrupt. There was no good in him. There wasn't even any good with his goodness to his parent, to his father. There wasn't any of this bitter. You know, the child, the son towards his father, even that wasn't there. No deen, no respect, nothing. He completely disowned his father, and that's it. While his father was after him, alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, this should not be an excuse for us parents to think, well, if Nuh alayhi salam, so I hear this all the time, if Nuh alayhi salam's son was corrupt, who am I? And then we give up on our own children. Wrong. Those who analyze the verses of the Quran will see, that for 950 years, Nuh did not give up on his son any night or any day. Even knowing that his son had gone astray, he was always trying to help him. And for us, no matter how astray your children go, no matter what happens to them, brothers and sisters, always continue to try to help them to be guided. No matter how bad. Unless they become seriously harmful to their children to your other children or to your family, such as drugs or something like that. But even then, you must still reach out to them as parents as much as you can. And the rest is up to Allah. This is the duty of a mu'min. We never know when hidayah comes in. We never know when guidance comes in. So we never give up on our children no matter what. And this is the example of Nuh Right up to the point when he built the ark. 
Nuh السلام, still hoped that his son would climb on with them. But subhanAllah, as we'll see in a minute, it didn't happen. As Nuh السلام, was building the ark, Allah says in the Quran, وَكُلَّمَا مَرَّ عَلَيْهِ مَلَأٌ مِّن قَوْمِهِ سَخِرُوا مِنْهِ Every time the elite members, the big people, among his people used to pass by him in the mountain when he was building the ark, سَخِرُوا مِنْهِ They used to tease him and mock him. They used to say, look everyone, building a ship in the mountain, we told you he's crazy. Who builds a ship in the mountain? Crazy. And this is what I was saying before. Those endued with knowledge don't look at things on surface level. They analyze and think there must be a secret behind this. They don't judge very quickly. The wise people, you find them, they stay quiet. They don't talk very quickly. They don't talk too much. They're not quick at responding. They think. If you encounter that person, know that you've got to be very careful with your words because these people think deeper than what you think. But people who respond too quickly and throw their words, know that they are not very intelligent. They're just surface level. And there's the difference between the person of brains and the person who's not. Noah used to look at them and he used to smile with ease and he used to say, In minna. If you want to mock me now, فَإِنَّا minkum kama We will soon mock you the same way you're mocking us. How? With what's about to happen. And you shall know who is the one who is guided and who is not. In a narration, and uh, this is the Israeli tradition as well, they say that uh, they mocked his ark so bad. Now, I'm not sure about its authenticity, but I'll tell you this story. I love saying it because it's funny. The kids will get a good kick out of this one. They say that they used to uh, go to his ark and they used to use it as a toilet. They used to poo-poo in it. <laughs> poo-poo. See, I told you the kids will laugh. And they filled it with so much feces and poop that it stunk really bad. Until one day, one of those men, he was doing his thing in there. And uh, what happened was, I, sorry, I forgot to tell you, a disease developed in their skin. And no one could find the cure to it. So one day, one of those men with the disease in his skin was doing his thing and he slipped. Maybe too much poop, it became slippery. <laughs> Is the young boy there laughing? And when he fell on this feces, what happened was that the story says that after a few days he was cured. His, 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 his skin was cured. And when people saw that, they go, what happened, man? He goes, well, I fell on, on poo. <laughs> so they all started going to the ark and cleaning it up from all this medicine <laughs> and putting it on their skin until they were cured. Mm. Now, as I said, Allahu A'lam about the authenticity of it, but this is in the Israeli traditions. Anyway, brothers and sisters, when uh, he built this ark, there is a description to it by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud ibn Mas Abbas and others. They say that the ark was approximately, I'll give you in current day uh, uh, um, measurements, something equal to about a kilometer to one and a half kilometers long. One and a half kilometers long. And about 300 meters wide. And about 200 meters High. And it was made out of three stories. And the top was also oval. It was concave as the bottom. Why? Because when the rain was going to come down, it's going to come down like a in north, like, like it's like a whole ocean, like a tsunami coming down. So it had to cover it and it falls off. And so he built it like in that fashion. Uh, and then one day. Nuh salam sees the oven. It was boiling with water. Water was coming out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Yalla, let's go. He started gathering a pair of each animal. Now the Quran does not specify which animals, how many animals. It said min kulli, from every animal, from every creature, a pair. Now we don't know if it means every animal in the, on the entire earth or every animal within the region that was going to be destroyed. I personally lean more towards the tafsir that it was animals only within the region that he called in. Why? Because his stories is a fact 
that people in the time of Nuh existed only in that region, the Middle East and towards Iraq, and most likely Iraq and Babylonian area, all the way down towards modern day Turkey um, or Armenia. And the people weren't very large in number. They were probably a few million, and that's about it, the entire earth. And they hadn't spread out yet to Australia and America and China and all those other places. So the flood, and Allah knows best, flooded the region which Nuh made dua against. He said, Rabbi la tathar ala ardi min kafirina dayyar. Oh Allah, do not leave a single kafir on the face of the earth. So wherever there was a kafir, the flood was going to reach them. It had no business reaching the animals all the way across the seas. Nuh salam can't reach them across the seas to go to Africa. He can't reach them. Right? He can't. He has to sail. So those animals are Muslim. And Allah is not going to destroy Muslim animals. It's only the kuffar. Now that's one tafsir. There is another tafsir that says every animal on earth, he gathered it, and every the flood reached all over the earth. But Allahu A'lam, this is still till today not, or, uh, um, not ascertained. Allah. The point is, the animals came up because Allah saves the animals, the animals are believers. And the 80 believers, Allah says, Illa ahlaka, uh, illa man sabat qawl, wa man aman. Allah says, and put the believers on with you. So, approximately 80 believers, which include members of his family. Now, which members of his family didn't believe? A few. We said his wife and his son. In the Israelite traditions, he had three sons named Sam, Ham, and Yafith. Japheth in, in the biblical terms. Sam, Ham, Yafith. Now, there's only one hadith I came across, which is reliable, that the, by Imam al Dhahabi. He says that the Prophet ﷺ named three of his sons Sam, Ham, and Yafith. As for the Israelite traditions, they say that only these three sons were on the ark. No other family member, and that human, the human race, all came from only these three sons afterwards. The Quran does not specify only these three. In fact, the Quran refutes that. Even though historians did say that it was these three sons that people were born back from, I beg to differ, and some ulama do, because in fact the Quran is Surah Isra and Surah Maryam. Allah says, for example, The offsprings of those whom we put on the ark with Nuh. Meaning, the children of those who were on the ark. Who was on the ark? The believers and members of his family. So who is to say that only those three sons the Quran didn't say? And in another verse in Surah Maryam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these are among the prophets whom Allah has blessed. Uh, as the verse goes on, Min Adam from the offsprings of Adam, wa mimman and from those whom we placed on the ark with Nuh. So he mentioned the other prophets by name, but when he came to Nuh السلام, he mentioned those who were with him on the ark. Their offspring. So, Allahu Alam, Allahu Alam, I think the correct opinion is that the, the human race cannot be traced only to these three. But if it was true that the human race was to be traced to these three, it would mean, in a, an, an unreliable hadith, uh, says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought out from Sam Let me find it because I'm going to make a mistake with this one. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought from Sam all the Arabs, the Persians and the Romans, and from Ham the Africans and the Barbars. The Barbars are nomads of ancient modern day Algeria. Uh, is that what they call that thing? And Yafith, Ya'juj and Ma'juj came from him, along with the Turks. Not the Turks of today, but they're referring to the ancient Mongols. And the someone, some people called Saqalib, Saqalib. They are the modern day Russians and the likes of them. Because the, the Romans weren't really white and blonde hair. The yeah. Romans, the Byzantines, were actually dark. Sin. No? Sin. Sin. Jaina. 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 Jaina.
China. Ah, Sin. Sorry, yes, Afwan. Forgive me, Sheikh, it's my fault. No, no, La Ham wa Lasa. Many Sinian, the Asians. The Asians, I think the Asians came also from uh, Sam, yeah. Maybe, maybe, yeah, because the Mongols were a bit Asian. Mushkida? Maybe, maybe. Anyway, brothers and sisters, uh, we said this is an unreliable source, Allahu A'lam, but from all the believers that were on the ark. Allah says, We opened the doors of the sky with water that gushed down non-stop. And we made the earth explode with fountains upon fountains and rivers. The water of the sky, of the heavens, and the water of the earth met in accordance with a decree from Allah. And suddenly, within a few moments, like maybe minutes or even hours, you see the ark, the, the, the ocean, the water reached the mountain in only a day or two. And within only a few hours, the ark started to sail. Allah says, Suddenly, if you were to look at the ark, O Muhammad, you would see it floating in waves as big as mountains. That's how Allah describes it. And suddenly, who did Nuh see before the ocean filled the mountains? He sees his son, Kan'an. And Nuh fatherly emotions overcomes him. He gets scared for his son. He forgets for a single moment that he is a prophet. The human instincts of fatherhood came into him. Because prophets are what? Are they angels or humans? They are humans. So it's an, it tells us that Nuh was a human. Yet look, Allahu Akbar, how his work was. But for this time, the fatherly instincts kicked in. His love and his compassion for his son kicked in. And he didn't want to think that he is a kafir. In fact, his son didn't tell him. And Nuh didn't really know. But he wanted to give his son the benefit of the doubt. He didn't care about his wife because he knew his wife had betrayed him. But what he remembered was who? He remembered his son before his wife. And he said, Allah says, وَنَادَى نُوحٌ ابْنَهُ Nuh called out to his son, Nada, from a distance. Ya Bunay, oh my son. The word Bunay is like a close, intimate thing. Ya Bunay, irkam ma'ana. Come and climb on top with us. وَلَا تَكُمْ مَعَ الْكَافِرِينَ Don't be among the disbelievers. His son did not even pay attention. From a distance he looked at his father without care. And he said, سَآوِي إِلَى جَبَلْ يَعْصِمُونِ مِنَ الْمَاءِ Dad, I'm going to go to a higher mountain. Don't worry, the water won't reach me. قَالَ لَا عَاصِمَ الْيَوْمِ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ Nuh said to him, there is no saving from the decree of Allah. إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمْ Except him, Allah gives mercy. <coughs> as soon as he was still talking to his son, trying to save him, the son was neglectful. He started walking away from his father. Allah then cuts the story in half and doesn't continue and says, The waves intercepted between them and his son became among the ones who drowned. Allah didn't even say his son. In the beginning, he says, he said my son. So Allah acknowledges that he is his son. But when he talked about Allah taking him with the waves, his son was so insignificant and filthy and disobedient and rebellious, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't even mention him after. He says, وَحَالَ بَيْنَهُمَ الْمَوْجُ فَكَانَ مَنْ مُغْرَقِينَ So the waves took, you know, intercepted and he took them and he, he became among the ones who drowned. And then Allah changes the story, doesn't want to talk about his son anymore. And then he goes back to the ark. The ark started sailing. Allahu alam how long some ulama, there's differing opinions. Some say months, some say year, some say weeks. Allahu alam. And then Allah ordered the earth to swallow its water and the sky to stop raining and the ark started to settle as the water went down and Allah said وَاسْتَوَتْ عَلَى الْجُودِ and it landed, settled on a mount on Mount Judi Mount Judi, from Allah I did a lot of research we don't know exactly where it's from some say it's Babylonia but the correct opinion of Allah is the actual Mount Judi it's called Mount Judi today in, 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 in uh, Ararat not, not Australia, Ararat, another Ararat, in Armenia. 
in Armenia. Allah Alam, they say they discovered its fossils. Allahu Alam. And Allah says in the Quran, We have left it as a sign for those who came after him. Maybe not a sign for us today, because that's such a long time ago, but a sign for the generation that came after him, before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Till today, it's not ascertained exactly where it is. Now, when it settled, and everything was settled, and the animals came out, Nuh alayhi salam, all this time, was thinking about what? He's thinking about his son. Allah, can you imagine the agony, and the pain Nuh alayhi salam is going through? So he said, Oh my Lord, Inna ibn min ahli. Quiet between him and Allah. You can imagine him crying. Agony and pain. Oh my Lord, my son is one of my family. Wa inna wa'dakal haqq. And your promise is always true. Wa anta ahkamul hakimin. But you are the wisest judge. I'm not going to question you. But he did. Ya Lord, you promised me they're going to save my family, in other words. And my son is one of my family. Allah responded, Ya Nuh, innahu laysa min ahlik. No, you got it wrong. He is not one of your family. Brothers and sisters, I have to cut the story short now. And I want to continue with the story of... Uh, actually, I have a, a thing to go to, a marriage to do for someone. So I'll finish this little part off, insha'Allah, and then I have to cut it short, insha'Allah, and excuse me. So I'll finish this little part, that's very important. Allah said to him, he's not one of your family. إِنَّهُ عَمَلٌ غَيْرُ صَالِحٌ He is a product of work that is irreparable. <coughs> he is irreparable. And Allah did not say, he is a product of your upbringing. He said, he is a amal. He is an act that is corrupt. Why? To respect Nuh salam that you did not fail in your job to bring him up. He, in another verse, this verse can be recited in two ways. Innahu salih, or you can say, Innahu amila ghayra salih. He did acts which made him corrupt completely. So your son chose this way. A good example is to say this. If you've got a body part that is corrupt and full of disease, and if you leave it, it's going to kill your body. The doctors come and amputate that arm off your body so that the rest of your body can be safe. We don't say the arm is not part of your body. It is part of your body. Like Nuh's son Kanaan was part of his family. It's, it's, it's his blood. But the family that Allah means here in this context is your family who followed you in belief. It's not a tribal dispute between your son and the tribe. Otherwise, I would have saved your son. This is a dispute between haq and batil, righteous and non-righteous, belief and disbelief. And ya Nuh, you didn't know. فَلَا تَسْأَلْنِ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ don't ask me about something you don't know have you have no knowledge of. Like you expect me to save your son, but you don't know that he was a hypocrite, a disbeliever. You didn't know that. So don't ask me again about him. And don't ever ask me about something out of your emotions. Allah says, Inni a'ivuka. I'm just reminding you. And takuna min al Not to be among the ignorant. Meaning, think before you ask. What did Nuh alayhi salam do? He said, Rabbi, my Lord, forgive me. I seek refuge in you from me being among the ignorant. And if you don't forgive me and have mercy upon me, I will be among the losers. Allah. He forgot about his son as if the flood had never happened. And Nuh alayhi salam returned from his normal, natural, fatherly nature back to the height of prophethood. His son had left the deen of Islam. He had corrupted in every way and he was irreparable. You asked me to save those who believe and to destroy the disbelievers. Guess what? Your son was among the disbelievers, so I took him. And lastly, I want to say, brothers and sisters, the ulama taught us about dua in this. They said, it's actually a sin to ask Allah for something and then expect something in specific. Like you ask for something and then you expect Allah to give you that something. And then when he doesn't give you that something, you feel that you have been cheated. So then you question in yourself. It's actually a sin to ask Allah a dua expecting a particular outcome. If that's the case, then you would have no you you have to know everything about everything, the past, the present, the future, the entire universe and everything in between to understand Allah's qadr. But we can't. 
Therefore, when we ask Allah for something, brothers and sisters, you keep your heart open and always say, Oh Allah, and you know what's best for me. We accept. And the harder the test, the more, the harder it is for a believer to pass this test. Like you have a son that's died, or a daughter, or a family member, or whether it's divorce, or whether it's death, or whether it's whatever it may be. Allah tests us in different ways. Will you accept Allah's qabr? Or do you expect something in particular? We cannot try Allah. We cannot negotiate with Allah and things like that. <coughs> for it's as if you are saying, Oh Allah, you didn't give me exactly what I asked for. It's as if we're saying, Oh Allah, I know just as much as you that this is the right thing. And you don't have that much knowledge. That's, that's in turn what you're actually saying. Therefore, brothers and sisters, it's not kufr, it's just a, a natural reaction, unless you believe it. But it's a sin to ask Allah and expect a specific return from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing else. So always ask Allah and keep your minds open and keep your dua general as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said. I thank you for listening. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Insha'Allah next week we'll finish the last part of Nuh alayhi salam and go into the story of Prophet Ibrahim, no, Salih and Hud. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa